I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education to order. There are two closed session items on tonight's agenda. The first is student expulsions in three cases and one student enrollment in one case. And the second is collective bargaining matters, discussion of negotiate by with the, I'll start again, discussion with uh, negotiator Daniel Thigben, Senior Director, Labor Relations regarding CSEA Chapter 127, General Operations Support, uh, Chauffeurs, uh, Teamsters, Local 150, Transportation, Supervisors, Teachers, and cert Certificated Personnel Units, and regarding the non-represented groups, uh, management, and confidential units uh, are in the closed session. Ms. Rye, will you uh, please give uh, instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment on the closed session agenda items? Certainly. If you'd like to offer a public comment on a closed session item and have joined us on the Zoom call, now would be your opportunity to raise your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, the bottom of the participant list on a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you dialed into tonight's board meeting. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment for the closed session agenda items? We do not have any raised hands at this time, President McKibben. Okay. Uh, if, uh, since there are no visitor comments uh, for the closed session, we will now move into the closed session and we will return to open session at 6.30. I call the, me the meeting of the San Juan Unified District Board of Education back to order. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending the meeting. The recording will be presented on, on the district website. In compliance with the order issued by the Sacramento County Health Officer on July 6, uh, 2022, directing all public meetings in the county to occur virtually until further notice. This Board of Education meeting is being held telephonically. Staff and others presenting at the meeting are, are calling in via Zoom video conferencing platform from separate locations. Uh, please stand for the virtual presentation of the colors by the Del Campo High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Ready. Color, Eng, Ut, Gary, Colors, Lauren, Arch. Left, left, left. Colors. Arch. Color guard. Alt. Present. Colors. Please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gary, Gallers, Post, Gallers. Colors, colors turn, arch.
Good evening and welcome. I am Michael McKibben, board president. Joining me tonight is Ms. Zima Creason, board vice president, Ms. Pam Costa, board clerk, and Mr. Saul Hernandez, board member. Superintendent Ken Kern and other staff members are also in attendance. Board member, Ms. Paula, Paula Viasquez is absent due to illness. Before we begin, I would like to review the two methods that are available to submit public comment for tonight's meeting. First, the first option is to submit a written comment using the comment form located on the district website at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a written comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a, a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Written comments are limited to 1500 characters. Comments will be provided to the members of the board. The second option is on the Zoom platform where you may use the raise your hand function. When you are, when, when you are called on, you may share a comment via audio during the meeting. Please note that by law, 9323 limits visitors' comments to two minutes per speaker with no more than 30 minutes per single topic. Time will be extended for any speaker who uses an interpreter. interpreter. Please be aware that public comments, including your name, become part of the public record. Alternatively, the meeting may be viewed in the district's YouTube channel where it is being live streamed. We now move to uh, item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? If not, I'll, I'll move the item. Now second. Okay, it has uh, been moved uh, by Ms. Creason, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. Uh, and, uh, and these are the uh, uh, to approve the minutes of January 11th. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, that that uh, vote was unanimous. Thank you very much. We now move to item E1, recognitions. Tonight, we have two recognitions. We will begin with the 2022 Classified Employees of the Year, Mr. Opa. Or Apollo. President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kurt, Ms. Cunningham, I'd like to start tonight by acknowledging some people who have done a lot of work behind the scenes, Ms. Diana Marshall, Program Manager at Human Resources, Ms. Cheryl Mayo, the Human Resources Administrative Assistant. Uh, without their work behind the scenes, tonight would not come through so seamlessly, and I just want to show my appreciation for them. They were really the stars behind the scene, and so to thank to Diana as well as Cheryl. Before we get started in introducing our six 2022 in classified employees of the year, I would like to welcome Adara Gunn, who is the president of the California School Employees Association, Chapter 127, to say a few words reg regarding the classified employee of the year winners for 2022. Adara? Paul, I do not see her on here, is she? I got a text that she would be here, so I would assume she would. She is actually being promoted to a panelist right now. So if you give us just one second, she should be able to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I, as president of CSEA Chapter 127 for San Juan Unified, want to provide a huge thank you to all classified employees working hard out there during these trying times and a special congratulations to our classified employees of the year for a job well done and an honor well deserved. We are sure your friends, families, and coworkers are as proud of you as we are. Classified employees, including the very individuals being honored tonight, keep the lights and heating and air on, classrooms and sites clean and sanitized, spend time with students in our classrooms and so many other integral things to keep our district open and ready for our students to learn. It is an honor to be here this evening to assist in recognizing and thanking these six individuals. 
CSEA would like to thank the board, Superintendent Kern, and the cabinet for its continued support of the classified staff. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Adara. I'd also like to just take a moment to call out and acknowledge Mr. Kurt Benefield, who is a labor relations representative for CSEA. Kurt is a true professional and a um, outstanding advocate for our classified employees. And he is a um, pleasure to work in partnership with, and we appreciate all he does for our district. So our first winner tonight is Mr. John Weathers. John was hired in 2006 and has worked as a custodian at Mesa Verde High School in Grand Oaks Elementary until 2014, when he became the elementary head custodian at Trajan Elementary. John has had seven teachers, had, excuse me, had seven teachers nominate him for Classified Employee of the Year. The common theme through all the nominations is that John keeps the, the campus looking amazing. He takes pride in the school and enjoys making the school a welcoming environment. John goes above and beyond to support the staff by assisting them in moving furniture or getting the projector or the Apple TV to work, to proactively support new staff members to get settled in. Most importantly, he is a role model for our students. He does this by interacting with them in the hall and the playground, by knowing the students by their first name and assisting them with their needs, sometimes unlocking classes or helping them clean up messes. John is compassionate, caring, and deeply committed to our community. Congratulations, John, and thank you for all you do. Our second winner is Natalia Aguirre. Natalia was hired in 2017 and is currently a district community engagement specialist with previously held positions of administrative assistant and secretary. According to her nominator, Elizabeth Zeladon, Natalia is constantly finding new ways to bring in community partners onto campuses and to help fulfill needs and remove barriers for our students always going above and beyond to find solutions for students and families. It's through her dedication and passion that San Juan is able to have so many community partners who donate and volunteer their time to our students. She doesn't just take from our community partners, she also gives. She puts in the work to make sure our district's our partners are supported during fundraisers that have nothing to do with our schools. This makes our community partnerships ongoing and strong. She could best be described as kind-hearted, patient, hardworking, dedicated, professional, positive, and a team player. Congratulations, Natalia. Our third winner is Sean Bennett. Sean has been working with San Juan since 2000. He started his career working as a maintenance custodian and then became a heating and air technician. He is currently a nutrition services cafe equipment technician. According to his, his nominator, nutrition school worker, Penny Gardner. Sean is the glue that holds the department together. He immediately comes when he's called or needed. He takes time to listen and then explains what's going on. He finds parts and finds ways to finish the job professionally and quickly. He is knowledgeable, resourceful, motivated, and self-reliant. He is always calm and finds a way to solve emergency situations. He is a lifeline to our daily tasks. He affects us all in a positive way. I am so grateful to have such a wonderful coworker in Sean. Congratulations, Sean. Our fourth winner is Zaneda Kamai. Zaneda was hired in, 21, in 20, 2001 as a campus monitor at Gold River Discovery Center. In 2007, she transferred to El Camino High School as a campus monitor and currently is a school community prevention spe specialist where she's held that position since 2012. Principal Randy Holcomb nominated Zaneda and said, Zaneda's more than 10 years at El Camino High School has earned her the reputation of being completely dedicated to the students and programs of El Camino High School. She conducts her work with enthusiasm, mindfulness, and heart. She is the ultimate team player. Her work performance is second to none, which is seen in her leadership of the Screaming Eagles cheer group and working with the student government students. She is quick to volunteer for various tasks and is a natural leader. She will complete these tasks in a timely fashion with a lot of heart and soul. She makes El Camino High School a better place. Congratulations, Anita. Our fourth winner is Melinda Bates, or Mindy. Mindy was hired in 2016 as an instructional assistant three at Ralph Richardson Center and has been there since her first day. Mindy works directly with the students in our autism program. 
Mindy comes to work with a smile on her face and treats each day as a new day. Mindy believes that the students we serve should be treated as human beings and goes about working with them hard every day. Her secret talent is as helping students find their voice. She endlessly works to ensure that the students have access to the vocabulary, whether it's icons, iPads, or their own voice, and that they're heard. Amanda Morgan, teacher who nominated Mindy said, she is a dedicated leader at our site and a true role model for her peers. She is always willing to assist, assist new employees learning to work with the student population we serve. Her passion, dedication, and overall amazingness is a gift to the students at Ralph Richardson Center. Congratulations, Mindy. Our sixth and final winner is Aaron Perini. Aaron has been with the San Juan Unified School District Te Technology Department for 13 years when he came aboard in 2009 as a database administrator. Peter Skrabinski, Director of Technology, nominated Aaron and said Aaron's work is critical to the su success of our department and the district. Aaron reviews the SIS system daily before school staff starts, before school starts to make sure our student information systems are functioning correctly for staff and students. Peter compliments Aaron's work because of his willingness to help and go above and beyond the call of duty of the district. One, Pete, one, one very interesting example was when Peter, was, that Peter gave us is when Aaron was actually on vacation in Hawaii and because of the three hour difference had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to make sure the system was working. He did that because earlier in the week there had been some problems, but he was so, he was so uh, wonderful to, to, to get up early and make sure that the system worked for our students. Congratulations, Aaron. So President McKibben, Superintendent Kern, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our six amazing people, our classified employees for 2022. Thank you for all that you do for our students. Without you, we would not have the district that we do. And so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McKibben and, Ms. and, and Mr. Kern. Thank you very much, Mr. Apollo. That, that's a, quite a list that you just brought to us. Do any board members have any comments or questions? I do. This is Ema. Thank you. Not everybody's on my board, so I don't know. What, so please call out because I can't necessarily see you. Uh, Ms. Creason. I just want to echo the thanks, and I'm sorry we couldn't all be together to celebrate you and all that you do. Um, I was clapping on mute, so I want to just clap where you can hear me. I'm so incredibly thankful. Well, can we all as a board just kind of clap? <laughs> like, pop on mute. You know, I'm sorry the energy isn't the same when we're all together, but just know from the bottom of my heart, I'm just so, so thankful. Um, several of you I've had the opportunity to engage with, either as a board member or as Caden's mom. And I've seen firsthand the wonderful that work that you do, not only for my own child, but our whole entire school community. So just many, many thanks. You um, absolutely deserve the recognition. And I'm really thankful for all you do. Are there any other comments from any other board members? Thank As I so say, much. I can't see all of you. So thank you. Okay. So... Thank you, uh, Ms. Gunn, uh, Mr. Benefield, and John, Natalia, Mindy, uh, uh, Sean, Aaron, and Zanita. Uh, you are indeed the lifeblood of this organization, and, and thank you for representing all of the classified employees. We are now uh, uh, at item E1. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we are. We are now, now uh, at our next recognition, uh, which is for the National School Counseling Week. Ms. Schnepp. Thank you, President McKibben. Good evening, President McKibben, Superintendent Kern, members of the board, and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, the superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number A409, proclaiming February 7th through the 11th as National School Counselors Week. The work of our counselors, now more than ever, is multifaceted and critical. They help prepare our students academically and socially for life beyond our schools. Joining me tonight is Tracy Locke, our lead counselor, and Brett Wolf, Director of College and, College and Career Technical Education, as well as Adult Education. 
At this time, I'd like to invite Tracy Locke to say a few words on behalf of our counselors. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for having me. It is my pleasure, as always, to represent um, school counselors across K-12. Um, we are growing in numbers and have over 90 school counselors site-based working hard and diligently supporting our families, our students, our sites. Um, as you know, school counselors cover the three domains of academic support, personal, social, and college and career, and they work every day offering tier one lessons to our students. I am so proud of the work that they're doing within our Naviance platform, as well as tier two um, interventions, along with their tier one and, you know, spatterings of tier three. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate and am proud of, of all the work they're doing, especially, especially now, as Ms. Schnepp mentioned. So I will be very happily sharing this recognition with them tomorrow, and um, I'm sure that they very much appreciate everything. Thank you. Do any board members have any comments or questions? Just a sincere thank you to our school counselors, to all of our counselors that are working with our students. Now more than ever, we need you and we thank you for all that you do. Thanks so much. We do it with our hearts. I saw Ms. <laughs> Creason uh, nodding. I Yes, I did, but I think Mr. Hernandez was also going to say something. I don't want to take his spot. No, no, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to echo the thanks. Um, if I heard you correctly, um, 90 counselors for our over 40,000 kids. I mean, that's huge. Yes. It's just huge, you know. <laughs> uh, We're getting you know, there. We're the baby steps. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, there's a huge staffing shortage in schools, but with mental health perfection, professionals um, nationwide. And so to do all that you do with the little that we have, you know, it's just absolutely amazing. And I have seen again, firsthand as Caden's mom, the wonderful connection that he has with his school counselor um, at Arden and at El Camino and just the care and the love and the extra mile. Uh, not only to my kid, he also shares how his friends are supported. And, you know, so often your department is the first stop when kids are experiencing mental health challenges and they don't know what's going on. So just so appreciative of all that you do. Um, and please let us know if we could ever be supportive of all the wonderful things you do for our kids in our school communities. Oh, thank you very much. We pride ourselves in being strong advocates. And that's a number one thing in mind. When every lens we have, it's how do we advocate for students? So it's very, it, it, it fills my heart to hear you say that. Thank you very much. It shows, it really does. And Mr. Hernandez, did, did you have something you wanted to say? No, just thank you. Appreciate all that you do for our kids. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a motion to adopt resolution uh, number A409 proclaiming February 7 through 11 as National School Counseling Week? So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Costa, seconded by? Zima. 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 Uh, Ms. Creason, okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, uh, that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schnepp and Mrs. Uh, Ms. Locke uh, for Thank you very much. recognizing our counselors. We now move uh, uh, to E2, high school student council reports. Tonight, we will hear from student representatives from Bella Vista High School and Del Campo High School. Welcome, and let's begin with Sarah Arada from Bella Vista High School. Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Curran and Ms. Cunningham. I am Sarah Rada, one of the social and cultural representatives from Bella Vista High School Student Government. Thank you for inviting us to come and share all the events happening at Bella Vista. As students return to school after a very much needed winter break, their hopes for finishing out the year strong and the promise of returning to normalcy in terms of hosting events and activities stay strong. Hopefully, if COVID cases decline as we near the end of our semester and restrictions ease back, we will be able to host the events that our student government has been planning and working on. We have been planning outdoor events that give students something to be excited about, but also comply with and are accommodating towards COVID guidelines. For example, tailgates before sport events, an outdoor movie night with snacks, and a spring fest in April on the football field with live bands, food trucks, and raffle baskets. 
We know that it's possible that we may not get to carry out these events in the future, but we are hopeful that things will improve and we in student government want to be proactive about making these plans so that, so that if they do happen, we will have them ready for the student body. On another note, something new that has been introduced to Bella Vista High School student government this year is the position of social and cultural representative. I, along with my co-chair Ashley Haro, who spoke at the last district board meeting, have had the opportunity to take on and be the social and cultural representatives at Bella Vista. And we've been working hard to help our student body and raise awareness for topics that are important to society and to adolescents. One of the things we decided to do at the beginning of the school year was to have different awareness months for each month of the school year, each month having its own topic that we focus on. This past December, for example, we had our stress and anxiety management and awareness month. Part of the reason why we chose that for our focus for December was because of finals and the end of the semester, and we know that students tend to struggle in that time. We hosted a discussion circle with a group of students who reported having high levels of stress and anxiety and were willing to participate in the discussion. Me, along with one of the counselors, talked with these students and we had a really productive session. It was amazing to be able to just listen to how the students felt, how they were coping, and to the things they thought the school could do to help them. They were able to share healthy coping mechanisms for when they feel anxious or stressed with each other. There is no strict agenda for the meeting and letting them take charge of what they wanted to talk about seemed to be helpful and allowed them to feel comfortable enough to share their thoughts and feelings in a safe environment. That is our intention with this position. We want students to overall feel more comfortable and feel heard at our school. The next thing we must ask of ourselves is what we want to do with the actions we started taking from engaging with our peers, what we want to do going forward, and how we can sustain and set a process that resonates with the student body that we can pass down to the people who will take over the position after us. We know that we are definitely going to continue doing our awareness months given our success in December, and we will also find ways to grow and improve them each time. Our next awareness month is going to be in February on racism awareness and education, cultural appreciation and equity. We hope that we can hear voices of students at our school so that they have the opportunity to speak out about their experiences and so that we know how we can help to improve the school and make it safer. We also hope to be able to educate the student body on racism so that students know how to detect it and prevent it, as well as to educate those who may be the ones committing these microaggressions without knowing. February is also Black History Month, which we are planning on acknowledging and honoring. That being said, we hope to continue recognizing and respecting future national historical and cultural appreciation appreciation months as well. Ultimately, the creation of this position is a step in bettering our school, and we are proud of the progress we have made. Overall, our main theme at Bella Vista for this semester is hope. We hope to be able to host events. We hope that our COVID situation improves, and we hope that hope has been sparked in students with the creation of the social and cultural representative position in student government this year. Thank you. Are there any comments uh, from uh, our questions from board members? Just thank you for your report. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Costa? Uh, you're on mute, Ms. Costa. Sorry about that. You gave me hope. Thank you very much. That was inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> and Ms. Creason. It's great to see you, Sarah. I was looking back at our past notes. Hey! Yeah, <laughs> hi! <laughs> again. A couple of shout outs, because I, I don't think I shared with my fellow board members. I was able to connect with Sarah and Ashley after their last uh, presentation. And we talked about a lot of great stuff. And I have followed up with some emails, so we should probably loop back and talk again. Yeah. <laughs> we had talk, and I know you're busy. I'm not calling you out, but I'm ready to move on a couple of things. Um, a couple of things um, that came up in those side meetings was talking about the need for gender neutral bathrooms, talked about what we can do to make lunches more as accessible to more students. We talked about how do we build an advocacy training for students. I mean, real forward thinking under your leadership. And I just, I, I got to tell you, it really touched my heart to hear about your leadership and your anti-racist efforts at your, in your school community. It's huge. So just thank you for the report. I always love hearing from you and tell Ashley, I say what's up and mm -hmm. love to loop back with you guys to move some of the work forward. I know you're super busy. So maybe we'll take one off of our very long list we created for ourselves. Right. No, but we would love to meet with you again. And thank you again. <laughs> Okay, yep, I'll send you an email tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah, Sarah, for your comments uh, and so forth. Uh, and we appreciate the work that you're doing. Very impressive. Next, we will hear from uh, Christian Cabral uh, from Del Campo. Christian? 
Good evening, President McKibben, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, and Ms. Cunningham. I'm Christian Cabral, Del Campo's ASB president. I am glad to be representing Del Campo High School tonight. Thank you for inviting me to speak about the many events taking place on campus. Right now, we're in the middle of our winter sports. These sports include soccer, basketball, and wrestling. These sports are enjoyed by many in our community. However, due to COVID regulations, the crowd has been limited to, to, to two players each game. This has upset many of our students that are actively wanting to participate and cheer on our boarding teams. The decision, the, the decision has also agitated many students because people have purchased what we call a Cougar combo where the main selling factor is that they can go to all sporting events for free with the, along with the purchase. Moving on to our new school culture, the admin has adopted new tardy policies for the classes. For excess amount of tardies, the school has now started to issue lunch deten detentions in Saturday schools. Ever since starting this, the amount of tardies has started to decrease. In addition, there has been a new rule where students who want to go to the bathroom now have to leave their phones in the class and are allowed five minutes to go and come back. This new rule has helped prevent the amount of people leaving class just to wander and meet up with friends. Being in person for school has helped many students feel a sense of normalis normalcy despite unpleasant situation. Um, yeah, situations. After speaking to many other students, this year is definitely a more positive one in the grades aspect. Those who are healthy and in person are doing a lot better in their classes this year compared to the last. However, COVID is still very evident in our daily lives no matter what. There's a noticeable amount of students who are absent every week due to either positive positive COVID tests or risk of being exposed. The administration office is working hard to prevent a future outbreak by offering free COVID testing every day before and after school. Lastly, along with the daily scene that COVID has affected, it has also led to the cancellation of many of our events that student government has tried to host. These events are our winter festival, Sadie's dance, elective fair, and our annual springtime event sports drama. The cancellation and postponing of these events has led to a decrease in morale regarding our school culture and spirit, which we have been trying our best to uplift after a year and a half of being online. We are hoping that restrictions will be eliminated soon and allow us to have these events again. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak and represent Del Campo. Thank you, Christian. Are there any uh, board members uh, that would like to, and I'm just gonna go down the, uh, uh, down the uh, line this time. Uh, first, uh, uh, Mr. Hernandez. I uh, just want to thank you for your report, Mr. Cabral. We appreciate your comments and we do understand there is a sense of frustration. Uh, we've been getting word, you know, but um, in all honesty, I, I'd re I'm just happy that we're at school and that we are that we are able to participate in sports for the time being. And so uh, I know that's hard to have just two people but on the other hand, I'm just glad that we're in school and able to do sports. But thank you very much for your report. I agree. Thank you. Ms. Costa. I'd also like to say thank you and echo Mr. Hernandez's comments. Thanks. And Ms. Creason. Thank you for your report. Uh, and I could, I too understand how frustrating it can be. Uh, staff has confirmed and so has the board that um, we haven't implemented any restrictions more strict than the county requires of us. And I know that sounds maybe like a pass the buck, but I just want you to know that we're not trying to make it any harder than it already is. Um, you know, of course, safety has come first, so we can keep campuses open, but I totally hear the frustration and, you know, I renew my commitment and stand by my commitment. We shouldn't be more strict than we're required to. Um, but I hear you and I can also understand, you know, when people buy a pass and they expect a certain outcome and they don't get it, um, that that's pretty tough too. So hoping that our numbers go in the right direction. So all of the wonderful activities you have planned for the end of the year um, can happen. You guys absolutely deserve it. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that this has been such a long road. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Again, uh, Mr. Cabral, thank you for your comments and, and, and so forth. And uh, we, uh, all of our board members have been uh, chafing under the, the kinds of things, but the fact remains is that keeping you and our teaching workforce and our classified workforce 
safe and healthy is got to be our first priority. But but it is hard. Now, I very much miss going to sporting events and that sort of thing. And uh, hopefully we'll be back there soon. We would like to thank you for your reports and for being here tonight. Student voice is very important to the board. We appreciate uh, your being here. You are welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting, but we recognize that you have homework and busy lives. So if you need to attend to that, this is a good time to return to the other things that need your attention. Thank you very much. We are now at item E3 and there are no staff reports. We will then move to uh, item E4, Board of Board of District Committees. We have a report from the chair of the Special Education Community Advisory Committee, Ms. Tita Cooper. Ms. Cooper, please begin when you're ready and welcome. Thank you and good evening, Board of Education for San Juan School District. My name is Tina Cooper, and I'm currently serving as the chair for the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education, known as CAC. I'm excited to share with all of you the updates on what our committee has accomplished thus far. As all of you know, CAC is included in the Ed Code for the purpose of advising our administration about the Special Ed Local Plan, also known as SELPA, annual priorities, parent education, and other related activities that impact students and disabilities. With that, oops, with that said, um, CAC's goal for this term is focused on the better understanding of the SELPA plan so that we are well informed when it comes time to vote on the budget in May. With the support and training provided by the Special Ed Department, our group now has a better understanding of how to conduct meetings, move initiatives, make decisions, and uh, while complying with the Brown Act. One of the most significant changes we have made this year is that we have moved our meetings from the first Tuesdays of the month to the third Wednesdays of the month so that we can receive timely self updates from the special ed department. We've also separated out the parent and family education presentations and moved them into the family check-in meetings. This not only allowed CAC to better focus on business items, it also facilitates our ability to have more in-depth discussions on items and areas of focus so that we're able to make better decisions. Moving the family education presentations to another platform also allowed parents to have a better opportunity for open dialogue and questions that were very limited under the Brown Act during our meetings. However, we do still provide input and suggestions on topics of interest to the special ed department while continuing our commitment and duties. To the right, we have subcommittees that focus on special areas that support CAC. One of the subcommittees uh, most of the subcommittees have not changed from year to year, but I would like to call attention to one of the committees that was newly formed in the last year. This is the bylaw committee. The committee is currently reviewing the CAC la bylaw language to provide clarification and updates in areas that were vague. Any suggested updates and changes will be moved to CAC for discussion and consensus and then general counsel for final review and adoption. The other continuing subcommittees include the You Light the Way Committee that plans and hosts the annual event that recognizes all those support special ed, and that is slated for March 30th. There's another committee called the Legislation Committee, which follows legislation that impacts special education and programs and coordinates with individuals interested in participating, participating in Legislation Day, which is scheduled for May 4th. And finally, we have the Membership Outreach Committee that supports recruitment and helps advertise CAC meetings and events. For this year, CAC would like support in increasing communications, awareness, and outreach for CAC events, such as the You Light the Way event occurring in March, as well as increased awareness of our group. This could include update to, of the CAC meetings in the San Juan Unified School Discount, District calendar, which is currently still showing our meetings on Tuesdays. Announcements to all school sites where it can reach parents as well as being translated in various languages. Um, but we are also open to suggestions from the board as to other areas or means where we can reach not just parents, principals, teachers, staff, and students alike. Finally, 
we would like to share some of the common and recurring topics that were presented during public comment. This includes the need and understanding of the universal design for learning and how it has been implemented in the classrooms, how and what inclusion inclusive practices the district is currently providing, the need for more and continuous training for staff to better serve students and disabilities, as well as continued and more training and information for parents that need help to better advocate for their children with disabilities, which can include IEPs, transition, dispute resolutions, and so forth. In moving forward, we will continue with our focus this term to understand the SELPA document better and look poss for possible future workshops and trainings. And in closing, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present to the board this evening. And on behalf of CAC, I would like to acknowledge and thank the continual efforts and support provided by Special Ed Director Vanessa Adelson, who we so greatly appreciate for her dedication in serving students and disabilities as well as our group as well as the entire special educational uh, department and team. A special thank you finally to just Ms. Zima Creason and Dr. Michael McKibben just for your active participation and continued support along with the Board of Education, teachers and the staff that directly support our students with disabilities. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, board members to come in and I will go down the list uh, uh, as usual because uh, we're having a few technical difficulties on this end. Mr. Hernandez first. Uh, Ms. Cooper, thank you much for your report. Um, it was very well done and we appreciate all that you do for these uh, special uh, children of ours that fit this category. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, Ms. Costa. Also my thanks for the report and please keep us updated. That was really very beneficial, thanks. Absolutely, thank you. Ms. Creason. Just a really great report, Ms. Cooper. Just really appreciate the time that you spent on it. Um, it's so helpful to hear from the committee's perspective. How, what, what's going on and how we can be helpful and really to be advised by your lived experience. And so, and that's not easy to do. I mean, that's hard stuff to dig into. And so just really appreciate the report. It was great. We'd love to hear more of that. Um, I was taking notes as you talked. And so we'd love to follow up with you on a couple of items. And I also just want to give you a shout out. Um, Ms. Cooper spends, of course, her time leading the CAC, but also she has side calls with me as the board liaison, spends time on presentations like this, speaks to parents, speaks to others in leadership. It's a huge job, um, along with everything else she has going on outside of SJUSD. So great report, and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to particularly call out the uh, uh, things that I learned from the uh, check-ins when parents come in and ask specific questions and so forth. And every time that happens, I learn about something else and, and indeed do to take notes and, and learn more about the kinds of ca capabilities and capacities uh, that are out there. So uh, Ms. Cooper, thank you very much for your report. It was very thorough, very informative, and we look forward to, uh, to your next report. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank Would you, you like to close? Um, I think I'm good, but thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We are now at items E5 and E6, and there are no reports from or employee organizations or other district uh, committees. So we are now at closed session uh, items. Uh, are, uh, that's E7. Uh, Ms. Costa, will you re report out, please? The board voted unanimously 4-0 to accept a hearing panel's recommendation of two suspended expulsions in case numbers S-29 and S-31. The board also voted unanimously 4-0 to accept as written one expulsion in case number M-14 and to accept a hearing panel's recommendation of one denied enrollment in case number OS-32. Thank you. Thank you. 
We are now at item F, visitor comments. Ms. Rye, will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment at this time? Certainly, President McKibben. This item is an opportunity for those individuals attending today's meeting to offer comment on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. If your comment is related to an item on tonight's agenda, we would ask that you hold your comment until that time, until that item is called and public comment will be offered at that time. If you'd like to offer a comment on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda and have joined us on the Zoom call, now would be your opportunity to raise your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device, the bottom of the participant list on a desktop Zoom client, or by pressing star nine if you dialed in to tonight's board meeting. Ms. Rye, do we have any general visitor comments? We do have one raised hand at this time, President McKibben. Okay. I would like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen counts down uh, the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda. So we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. Ms. Rye, would you please help facilitate the public comment? Certainly. Our first raised hand is from Ben Avey. And whenever you are ready, Mr. Avey. Mr. Avey, please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, President McKibben, board members, and superintendent. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to call in today and say thank you for keeping schools open. Uh, I know the district has had to do a lot of work and fill a lot of holes, but you guys have done a wonderful job in the fact that you have kept schools open and classrooms open for the most part, and we really do want to applaud you for that. Uh, I also want to thank all the parents who have been uh, quarantining their kids at home for extended periods of time. Many of them have run out of vacation time, have run out of paid sick time, and really are scrambling uh, to keep their kids home when they are uh, sick or exposed and in quarantine. Um, so thank you to those parents and also to the parents who are volunteering in classrooms as emergency teachers, uh, as emergency volunteers. The one other thing I wanted to bring up was, and this came up in the superintendent's parent advisory committee in my breakout group, and I think you heard it from the students today, uh, and I've heard it from many parents, is that need to return extracurricular activities. I know it's a hard thing to talk about right now, but I think we have to talk about it and we have to look towards doing it because it really does play an impact on a child's social and emotional health. Um, as much as we like to think of COVID-19 as binary in its impact, you're either sick or well, we know now that the mental health impact on students not being engaged outside the home really is a serious issue we have to contend with. And so we have to look beyond just whether somebody's gonna have COVID and we have to look at how do we have safe events that bring people together so that we can provide for their social and emotional health in addition to their academic health. I know it's a hard conversation to have and we're gonna to have to get creative, but as a community, it's just where we have to go. And I think we have to look at this spring as the opportunity to really start returning those traditional activities to our school district. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Avey. Uh, we now move to the consent uh, calendar. Uh, we are at item G. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment for items that are on the consent calendar? President McKibben, we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you. Uh, do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? I'm seeing mostly head shaking left and right. Uh, so uh, is, is there a motion to approve items G1 through G11? So moved. So moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hernandez. It has been moved and seconded. Seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? It is a unanimous, uh, again, four to zero. Okay, uh, now we move on to the uh, business items of the evening. Uh, we are on I-1, 
Resolution number 3095, authorizing remote teleconferencing meetings, Ms. Simlick. Thank you and good evening, uh, Board President McKibben, Board Members, Superintendent Kern. The superintendent is recommending that the board discuss and take action to adopt resolution number 3095. As background on January 6, 2022, Sacramento County Health Officer Dr. Kasiri proclaimed all public boards, councils, comm commissions, and other similar bodies shall suspend in-person public meetings and conduct all meetings virtually. As part of her order, she does require that uh, the board follow the Brown Act requirements, which would be part of the need for resolution to, uh, if you wish to continue to meet uh, remotely, you must pass a resolution that would be effective for 30 days. Okay. Ms. Rye, do we have any public com comments on this item? We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, all right. And then do any board members have questions or comments on this item? I am seeing, uh, I'm seeing uh, Ms. Creason. Just one note, just to reiterate what was said by Ms. Simlick, that this resolution is really to just be in line with the county order. This isn't something above and beyond that um, to be remote. So this comment's really just for community that may be listening in. It really is to be in line with the county health order, not something above and beyond. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else uh, uh, that would like to comment? See, uh, Mr. Hernandez, did you uh, just uh, say yes? Okay. No, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll move the item. Okay, the, there is a motion. There is a, I, I would like, uh, Mr. Hernandez has uh, made the motion to adopt resolution 3095, uh, 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 declare, proclaiming a local emergency, ratifying the, the proclamation of the state of emergency by the County of Sacramento on June, January 6, 2022, and authorizing remote conference, uh, teleconferencing meetings of the Board of Education for a 30-day period of the uh, Brown Act. Is there a second? Second. Is there any other discussion? I do have uh, uh, one item. Uh, Ms. Simlick, am I correct that, that we will have to uh, reauthorize this at, at, uh, uh, for another 30 day period if necessary? Uh, yes, yes, it's necessary. It must be done every 30 days. Okay. We have a, uh, a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? This item is unanimous four to zero. Thank you, Ms. Simlick, for, for presenting this item. We move on uh, to uh, I2, the uh, 20, uh, 2021 uh, audit report. Ms. Stein Hebler. Good evening, Hebler. President. Sorry. Good evening, President McKibben, board members, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham, and members of the public that have joined us this evening. The superintendent is recommending that the board accept the 2020-2021 audit report as prepared by the district independent auditor. Each year, school districts are required to have an audit of their financial statements performed. This evening, we will hear a summary presentation of the 2020-2021 audit report. Jen Aris and Jennifer Hall are joining us from Crow, our audit firm. Earlier today, they joined the San Juan Audit Committee to present the comprehensive audit report and answer questions from our committee members, which included board member Hernandez. Uh, before they get started, though, I'd like to thank Christy Blanford, our Director of Fiscal Services, and her team for their work on the audit this year. Thank you. Go ahead and get started, Jennifer. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for having us here tonight. I'm Jen Aris, a partner with Crow, and uh, it's my signature that you see on all of the opinions throughout the audit report. I'm just going to provide a high-level overview for you here, and I think what's important to understand is your audit was issued uh, on time in advance of the deadline, and really all of that credit goes to your uh, fiscal finance department and all of their hard work and commitment to the audit process, despite all the rest of uh, you know, the world spinning around them in, in this chaotic time that we had through fiscal year 2021. 
Um, Crow is engaged to perform a number of audits actually uh, related to the district. And so first and probably most importantly, we audit the financial information that is presented. Uh, we issue a financial statement audit and an opinion over uh, the accumulation of that financial information and an ultimate report that you see in front of you. We do that in accordance with generally accepted audit standards, uh, making sure that all of those uh, balances are recorded within uh, generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. And um, there's one new item to, to highlight for you this uh, evening in, in your report, and that is a, an emphasis of matter paragraph that's included within that financial statement opinion. And that really just speaks to the implementation of a new accounting standard. And so sometimes when you see an emphasis of matter, it may you know, pause and, and make you ask a question. Um, really, the, the standard setters uh, just wanted to change the um, the presentation of some information. And so it required taking those um, associated student body accounts and basically moving them from a, a separate schedule and putting them into the governmental funds of the district. And so um, no cause for alarm. It's just really kind of checking the box on the implementation of a new accounting standard. As part of our audit of the financial statements under uh, governmental audit standards, we also are required to evaluate the internal controls over financial reporting. We did that for the district and we were able to issue an unqualified uh, opinion or, or unmodified opinion. Um, so really a clean opinion. So in addition to the uh, you know, pristine opinion of, of your financials being materially correct, uh, also found the controls that are in place to accumulate that data uh, to be functioning and, and no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies were identified. Crow also performed an audit of the uh, federal programs, the, the federal revenue that's received by the district. Uh, there were four programs subject to audit in the current year. And again, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion. So uh, very clean results there. Lastly, we issue an opinion over the uh, state compliance procedures that are applicable to you as a district in the state of California. And we did have one finding in that area um, that you'll see results in a qualified audit opinion. So essentially we say uh, everything was in compliance except for uh, one particular area. And so toward the back of the financial statements, you'll see the write-up of the finding um, related to the school accountability report card. And um, what I shared earlier today in meeting with the audit committee is, um, you know, I think that it's important to understand that this finding in particular is really more of, I'm going to call it an administrative type item, uh, a clerical error, if you will. So essentially, one of our tasks is to compare one document to another. And there were just some inconsistencies noted uh, there between the two documents in, in three of the instances that we sampled. Um, this particular finding does not have a fiscal impact for the district. So that is always good news. And, you know, I think from a, a perspective standpoint, um, you know, it's, it's important to understand that there were a lot of moving pieces uh, related to state compliance during the year under audit, a lot of additional compliance procedures related to distance learning and record keeping related to that, um, you know, a number of new things related even to uh, federal programs and, and the grant revenue received there. And so, um, you know, just some industry perspective, if you will, uh, many districts uh, ha are having findings, you know, from a record keeping standpoint. And, um, you know, I think the perspective here is that this is kind of just a, a small drop in the bucket compared to, you know, all of the things that went right. And so given that there were no audit adjustments, uh, we had no adjustments posted to the information that was provided to us for audit. Um, and really just this one clerical finding that we had, um, you know, I, I think you should be really proud of the financial information that you have and the team that you have in place to um, handle that for you on a day-to-day -day basis. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, uh, I will start uh, with questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, in the first thing, uh, Ms. Rye, do we have any public comments related to the uh, audit? We do not have any raised hand that ran, raised hands at this time, Dr. McKibben. Okay, and now we'll move to board members and I'll start with Mr. Hernandez from Thank the audit committee. 
Thank you. And I just want my colleagues to know that I was uh, being the liaison on this audit. I just want you guys to know how proud we should be of our staff and our administration and everyone that worked so hard to help with this audit. When you just imagine a district of our size and to get a almost A plus report, we had one little finding. It's been addressed as Jennifer said, and um, we're hoping that we get an absolute 100% next time. But uh, just the fact that um, you know it's very clean and the most important things that our financials are uh, no findings there, which is my, in my opinion, the most important part. And, uh, and I just want to thank everyone to make that, uh, that made it so easy for Crow to, to do the audit, but at the same time, the findings that were so beneficial. So thank you so much. Are there any other uh, board members? Uh, I'd just like to add my thanks uh, in such a difficult year with so many things spinning. It's great to know that we have staff members who keep things moving smoothly. So thank you very much. May I, Dr. McKibben? Oh, yes, please. And I just want to echo my thanks and I appreciate uh, just the quick explanation of the emphasis of matter and the issue with the report cards. I totally agree. You know, little things are going to happen when there's so much big stuff going on. So I'm super appreciative of your work at Crow and the work of the team and just the time that you took to explain it. Because as you mentioned at the beginning of your report, you know, you look for certain keywords. And so I think, you know, if you're not an accountant and you're just in community that may know, you know, things to look for, I think it helps folks just understand what it really means. So really appreciate it. Certainly, yes. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we serve at the pleasure of the audit committee and those charged with governance. And so happy to address those questions at any time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a motion to accept the 2021 audit report as prepared by the district's independent auditor, Crow LLP? So moved. Mr. Hennis has, has moved and Ms. Acosta has seconded. All those in favor signify by saying, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Creason. Did you yeah, I think, I think it was I Ms. Creason that seconded that. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, Ms. Ms. Creason was the second. And now uh, all those in favor uh, of uh, this item signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, it is unanimous four to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Stahl Heber. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Crow LLP and all of the others who worked so very hard on this. Uh, it is truly impressive work. Okay, we now move to I-3, uh, uh, the redistricting of trustee map boundaries. Uh, uh, Ms. Simlick, uh, will you present this item? Yes, thank you and good evening again, President McKibben, members of the board and Superintendent Kern. In this matter, the superintendent is recommending the board to hold a public hearing to receive community input regarding revised map options and to provide input and guidance to the district's demographer on map options based on the 2020 census data. Before the public hearing, I would like to give an update on the district's community outreach efforts related to the trustee area changes. I would like to share my screen at this time. And um, the community outreach efforts first began in late November and early December of 2021, where the district's team updated the elections webpage that served as the hub of information related to trustee area elections. Outreach continued throughout December and January with frequent articles posted to the district website and newsletters, as well as phone calls and emails home to families. In addition, we also reached out to local media outlets and our community partners. And this has more detailed information on that slide. District staff also leveraged the district's social media channels to post frequently about the redistricting process and ran an ad on Facebook specific to the community meetings to be held in early January, 2022. 
a feedback form was posted that solicited feedback on the two proposed map scenarios. To date, the district has received 32 comments with the majority of responses being from parents and guardians. Much of the feedback received via the online form included questions and concerns around attendance boundaries and homeschool changes. As we are aware, the redistricting process does not affect attendance boundaries or open enrollment. In addition, we saw support of both scenarios and each of the two map scenarios individually. In response to the questions received through the community meetings, the team developed an FAQ sub page on the elections website that answered the common questions that the community had. The jam boards were also posted that contained all of the feedback collected from the community meetings, as well as a video presentation that was shared at the meetings. Lastly, we edited the feedback form to require a response to the prompt. This form will remain open until the next board meeting in February, which is currently scheduled for February 15th. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Simlick. I declare the topic of redistricting tr uh, trustee map boundaries a public hearing and is now open for public comment. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not have any raised hands at this time. And I'd just like to remind our participants joining us on Zoom that you can find the raise hand button on the bottom of your screen on a mobile device the bottom of the participant list if you join from a desktop Zoom client or by pressing star nine if you dialed into tonight's board meeting. Okay, we'll give a, a little bit of time, uh, uh, about another 15 to 30 seconds. And if there are no uh, hands at that time, then I will act. I'm doing my teacher wait time mm -hmm. right here. And I am not seeing any raised hand. Okay. There are no, uh, since there are no, no comments, I declare the public hearing closed. Do any members of the board have questions or comments? Just a quick thank you to those that uh, worked so hard on the, on the community presentations. I was able to attend one and it was extremely well done. The, the manner in which they received feedback from our community was well documented. And a special thanks to all the community members that attended and gave their opinions. And we heard you loud and clear. And again, just thank you so much for everybody. I'd like to echo that. I attended both of the public meetings and it was very well done. Staff did a great job of facilitating and the community members really were well informed and interested. I noticed on the written comments that there's still confusion between attendance boundaries and redistricting. And I hope that we can in some way communicate that to the majority of our public because that seems to be the issue that is causing the most distress. Ms. Creason, were you going to say? Yes, I, yes, please. yes I yes. have just a, just a couple of things and I'll start with agreeing with Ms. Costa. That was one of my comments too. A lot of confusion about the school boundary. So I'm hoping that there could maybe be some posts or communications out that just reiterate that because people obviously, which is great, are getting the message and did show up and did have comments. So they're seeing it. Um, so maybe we could do some more messaging, just reminding folks that this isn't, you know, changing any school boundaries. Maybe that'll ease some concerns. Um, I did have the opportunity to attend both of the um, remote community meetings and they were so well done. So I also thank staff for just organizing and collecting feedback in such a um, stakeholder empowerment kind of way. It was great. I want to remind folks too, because when you look at the numbers of how many people did respond, it may seem like small, it might seem very small compared to our huge, vast school community, but I want to, or district community, but I want to remind folks, we went through a lot of this work through the going by district process. Um, so, and there was a lot of feedback and a whole lot of meetings. So this wasn't, you know, although this is very specific on changes based on census data, um, because we just went by district so um, not that long ago, that really 
um, influenced a lot of where we are now. So I just wanted to point that out as well. And then one last question. I'm just wondering, did we ask school sites to share information directly with their school communities about this process? I would probably have to follow up on that, although I believe that we did reach out to, um, because we were doing newsletters, um, as well as phone calls and emails home to family. So I would hope that part of that was information received from the school sites. And Ms. Simlick, I could jump in here as well. Um, information was shared with our site leaders to promote in their own channels. But again, um, we did do two mass notification messages to all families district-wide as well. Yep, thanks for that. And I got those messages and they were great. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I know other people got them too. And I was just curious because I know even though we you did a lot from the district level, I think that there's still um, a lot of parents that just kind of, they keep their eye from the school site communications just because, you know, there's a lot going on and we all get a lot of emails. So that I didn't mean that as a criticism at all. I was just curious if we asked them to do so and it sounds like we did. So thank you. One, one uh, comment from me, uh, for me as, as this is the first time that we've had uh, two different kinds of boundaries and uh, in our attempt to get better, we will try to uh, make our language better, maybe using the word zones or areas or something like that to have to do with, with trustee areas and then can use the word boundaries for where your, where your students go. But we'll get better at it and we apologize for any confusion that there might have been but uh, we have not had this experience of having two different kinds of things uh, uh, that were describing boundaries at one time. Tonight was a discussion item and it will return for action on February 15th. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Simlick and all of those who participated in our community uh, forums related to this item. We now move to item I-4 the uh, uh, COVID-19 update, Mr. Kern. Thank you, President McKibben, board members and community members. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Allen and he is going to provide a very short update for us. Thank you, Superintendent Kern, President McKibben, board members, those who've joined us tonight. Uh, just wanna give a couple of quick updates regarding our COVID-19 cases and status. The good news is our case numbers are starting to come down. So where our student positive cases had stood at over 2,000, uh, as of this evening, we are at 1,698. Um, as we look at the number of cases that are expected to fall off in the coming days, we expect that to drop just a little bit more um, and then probably level out for a little while. We're about getting the equal number of cases coming in as we're getting to start clear out. Um, so we're gonna see that level off a little bit, but overall the case numbers have started to come down for both our students and our staff, staff setting at 300 as of this evening. Also wanted to let you know that we're doing an incredible amount of COVID-19 testing. So as we came back in January, testing was a very hot commodity. Uh, we did over 8,000 tests in the first week of school. We've continued to test uh, heavily since then for folks who've wanted to be tested. Um, so we are starting to see a little bit of that testing demand dip um, but we are continuing to see a very high positivity rate. So we're running about 15%, a uh, little over 15% of those tests are coming back positive, which is higher than we've seen throughout the entire pandemic. So that is certainly still concerning. We're gonna continue to watch that, uh, but it is a good sign that we're continuing to be able to offer those tests on a really wide scale uh, to all of our families who would like to access those tests at their school site or any of our central sites as well. Then I also wanted to just uh, touch on the county guidance regarding quarantine and isolation periods. Um, of course, that was aligned with the CDC guidance that came out in late December. There were two kind of versions of that that came out from the county as we came back from school. So we've been uh, doing some work to make sure that we implemented that as quickly as we possibly could and had the latest version of that implemented. I wanted to share with folks that we are implemented on the latest version of guidance regarding quarantines and isolation periods from Sacramento County Public Health. So our quarantine and isolation periods are the same as what the county is requiring of schools throughout this county. Um, and we are going to look at a new practice for implementing future revisions to those periods. Um, so we've been working to implement those absolutely as quickly as we can. We're still going to do that but we wanna give ourselves just a little more time to make sure that we have an opportunity to brief our site leaders so that we have a really good smooth implementation when those pieces do change. 
So from here on out, we will have a Thursday briefing with our site leaders. And then right after that Thursday briefing, the Monday following is when those new guidance pieces will become effective when we do get those new pieces of guidance from Sacramento County Public Health in relation to quarantine or isolation periods. Of course, if county health leaders come to us and say, hey, we need to do this absolutely right now, we will certainly uh, make sure that we move as quickly as we possibly can to implement anything that uh, is urgent and needs to be implemented urgently. And then finally tonight, just wanted to highlight for folks that we are um, certainly paying attention and uh, monitoring the conversation around vaccination mandates. Um, the, there was a bill introduced today uh, by a state senator that would make the vaccine for COVID-19 a requirement for school students. Um, that has uh, quite a bit of conversation and uh, uphill uh, trajectory, I think, to go through the state legislature. Um, so as of right now, what we do know is that the governor intends to have an executive order through the uh, California Department of Public Health that would require vaccines for students. However, in that capacity, it would also allow for personal exemptions and religious exemptions. So we know coming this summer, that is where we expect to be, absent something passing in the state legislature, uh, but we continue to monitor those conversations and any developments there so that as soon as we do have some solid information, we can share that with all of our families and our school communities as well. And that's all I have for you tonight. Ms. Rye, do we have any public comments on this item? We do have two raised hands at this time, President McKibben. Ed, will, you, uh, will you guide us through that process then, please, and uh, call on the people? Of course. Our first commenter is Ben Avey. And Mr. Avey, whenever you are ready. Thank you. Good evening again, Mr. President and board members. Uh, one thing that I think the, the district has done a great job is, as I said before, was making sure that we kept schools open. I think moving forward, understanding that COVID is not going anywhere and we may see surges in the future. Um, I do think it's important for us to look at the long-term implementation of emergency credentialed teachers, volunteers on campus? How are we utilizing and empowering parents who want to help out in an emergency? I know currently we're operating under an executive order that allows for emergency credentialing, but I really do think it would benefit the school district as we come out of this surge to really look at how do we maximize those parent volunteers for when the next surge comes, because it will come. We know it's going to come. We're entering an endemic. And so if we start you know, now on the tail end of this surge of figuring out what those systems look like, hopefully it'll put us in a position to respond uh, even more uh, in an even more impactful manner in the future uh, and hopefully creating less stress uh, for the school administrators who, as I've said before, are just doing a great job of keeping schools open. So long term, I think parents are a strategy that can support keeping schools open. I would also say that I think there's a lot of parents that are itching to get back on campus and help out. We know staff are burned out. Allow parents to carry some of that weight. We just have to be allowed to come back onto campus. I understand there's processes and procedures associated with that, but I do think it's worth the time and the effort uh, to hear them, to feel them, and allow them to support in the way that they would like to help. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And our next commenter is Kimberly Meyer. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Yes, thank you, um, Kimberly Meyer. I wanted to, based on the vaccination requirement that we're expecting to have on July 1, is there been any information that can be shared with parents or any information to the district on what the vaccination status needs to be, for example, if you're vaccinated May of 20, does the July of 2022, does that count as being vaccinated? My concern is that there hasn't been a lot of information on what it means to be vaccinated and if there's any time period that the vaccination must have happened within before the July 1 date. So that would be good to know um, sooner than later. I think that helps parents understand what what they need to do, especially those who vaccinated their children earlier in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your comment. And that, that was our final raised hand, President McKibben. Okay. Uh, do any board members have questions or comments? I'll start with Mr. Hernandez. 
No comment. I appreciate the report. Uh, I appreciate the comments tonight. Those are very, very good points, and we will uh, address those. And uh, again, I appreciate the report, and um, thank you very much. Mr. Hernandez, is an agendized item. I can actually speak to that second one. It's a similar question that we've actually asked. <clears throat> Specifically, I, act, I asked Dr. Casirier this um, this morning, uh, what's the definition of vaccinated? And at this point in time, we don't have an answer to that question. Is it, you know, both shots? Is it, is it the booster? So some of the questions that the community wants, we're also waiting for those answers as well. And we have stressed how important it is that we need to get this information in a timely fashion because it may have an impact on decisions parents make about their students. So what I can say is as soon as we do know, um, we will get that information out. Trent, would you agree with that? Or anything more you wanna add? No, just to emphasize, uh, there's certainly a lot of pieces that we're waiting to hear the details on. Um, so we are absolutely as anxious as other folks and are very much committed to getting that out as soon as we have it. Ms. Costa? I don't have any questions. Again, I just want to say thank you to staff for their just constant efforts to keep our schools open. They have been beyond anything that I think we have ever seen in terms of everybody pulling together, our classified employees, our administrators, our teachers, and parent community members who've been helping. And we are really very fortunate in San Juan to have such a collegial team. So thank you. Ms. Creason. I just want to first just thank um, you, Dr. McKibben and Superintendent Kern for adding this ongoing or this item to the agenda. And I hope we could keep it going as we're working through the, uh, I don't know what to even call it anymore. I know pandemic's probably not the right word, but as we work through coronavirus, I will just say that. Um, I really do appreciate that. Um, I want to applaud the district and under your leadership, uh, Superintendent Kern, that we brought testing capacity into the district. If I um, remember correctly, you had shared that many districts, um, and I'll, some, I'll say some districts in Sac County did not do that and outsourced their testing capacity, which really put a burden on them when it was time when everyone was looking for tests, we still had tests and we were able to provide that for our school community. So I really applaud your leadership and forward thinking on that, that we were able to uh, meet that need. And I think that put us in a stronger position to get through it. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you know, Trent's work in this area too. What I would say is we have the testing capacity at every single school, um, which is pretty phenomenal. So when you see students that are out, the ability to even possibly bring them back as well as staff sooner if they can have that negative test. The challenge is I think our numbers are much higher than other districts because of the testing that we do have um, on site. But I also think that's creating safer, safer places for our students and our staff. Um, but uh, yeah, it really was Trent and a whole group of folks looking at what was the best way we could provide testing. So I appreciate the comment. I'm sure others do as well. Oh, it was brilliant. Well done. Absolutely. And no, and thank you for bringing up our testing numbers are different, you know, in other districts. But if you don't ask the question, you don't get the answer. And I think we're better off knowing. And that's going to help us keep our school community safe and campuses open. So let's take the high numbers if that's what they are so that we can work through a reality <laughs> because I'm sure those numbers really are similar throughout the county. They just may not know. Um, I also just wanted to note, you know, as a parent, I get the notifications of exposure and I've really appreciated how those are coming through with the dates. Um, you know, I get a phone call, I get an email. It's very clear um, what I as a parent need to do um, for my kid in that, you know, when somebody in their class has been exposed. So I appreciate just want to really working very well for our family. And I've heard others say that they appreciate the notifications as well. Um, for this uh, community, I just want to note, this stuff continues to change. It, guidance changes quite a bit. You hear what's happening at the federal level, the state level, level at local level, not only the Sacramento County health orders, but orders through in other counties. And it, there's a lot of questions. And I think I just want to say it's okay to ask questions, um, you know, ask at your school site if you need to ask others, you know, of course I'm available, others are available to answer your questions. It's confusing stuff that changes a lot and we're talking about our kids. 
Um, and students yourselves, I know you have a lot of questions about, you know, what it all means and all the changes. So I just want to encourage folks to ask the questions that you have. Um, you know, we've been very transparent throughout the coronavirus. I'm really trying to not say pandemic anymore. Um, throughout this journey, um, and we'll continue to do to be so. So please just reach out and we'll get your questions answered. Thank you so much. Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. I just want to make a comment to uh, our community as well as, as we get closer to this and a lot of people are asking exemptions, what, what, is that, what do those mean and how are they defined? And so we're going to continue to get, try to get those answers, what that means. And as soon as we do, we will transmit that information as well. So I just wanted to say that. Okay. Mr. Kerner, would you like to close? Uh, okay, I thought you would say, okay. Thank you. Uh, we will move on now to the annual policy review, I-5, Mrs. Ms. Simlick. Thank you again, and good evening, uh, President McKibben, board members, and Superintendent Kern. This is the time of year that the board looks at four annual, uh, four policies that are required to be reviewed annually by board bylaw 9311. And of the, board, of the four board policies, there are two that are being recommended um, to have some minor revisions. Uh, we've had great staff uh, teams looking at each of the board policies, specifically in the Stahlheber and her team looked at board policy 3430. Uh, Ms. Schnepp and her team looked at board policy 6145. The FACE team looked at board policy 6020. And then Dr. Calvin and Brian Ginter looked at board policy 5116.1. And um, the two that are recommended for minor revisions are board policy 3430 and 5116.1. Uh, Ms. Rye, uh, do we have any public comments on this item? We do not have any raised hands at this time, President McKibben. Do any board members have questions or comments on this item? Just getting no's, no shaking. Okay, uh, this, is a, uh, this item will return for action on February 15th. Thank you, Ms. Simlick. Thank you. Ms. Simlick, could these come back on consent? Uh, yes, they can. Would that be of the interest of the board? Yeah. I'm seeing nods, it, yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, we now move to item J. Uh, board reports. Uh, we'll, we'll go down the line in, in the normal order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hernandez. Uh, just a quick report that I was able to attend uh, the LCAP uh, committee meeting as the new one of the new liaisons. Miss um, Costa and I are going to be co liaisons in that, and I was able to attend. And um, I just was excited to attend and looking forward to work with this outstanding committee. That's it. Ms. Costa, nothing? Okay, uh, Ms. Creason. Just enjoying my time, con continuing to talk to community, a lot going on and just appreciate all the effort of our entire district community, staff, um, everybody, parents, the students. Um, I did have a note and I lost it. And I'm really sorry, I was trying to bring it back. I wanted to acknowledge that um, we will not have another meeting until February, but we will be kicking off Black History Month in February. And especially in this time, um, I just wanna just shout out the celebration. You know, um, it was, I really warmed my heart at the beginning of this meeting when I heard Sarah from Bella just really talk about their anti-racist efforts. And, you know, the young folks give me all the hope in the whole wide world and we all need to follow their leadership because they're doing a great job. So, you know, happy Black History Month and let's all learn something new and just be supportive of all of our diverse, diverse and beautiful community in SJUSD. Thanks. I, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, several of the board members uh, attended the Superintendent's Parent Advisory Committee meeting this week. And thank you to all the parents who, who gave their ideas and so forth uh, uh, to us. Uh, uh, we Unfortunately, <laughs> we had to do this meeting on Zoom and so forth. And uh, again, uh, the, uh, the quality of the feedback and the quality of the interaction of those meetings, I'm 
constantly in awe of. Uh, thank you very much to Mr. Kern and to the staff and to the parents uh, that participated in that. Uh, we now move to future agenda items, uh, 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 item K. Uh, are there any board members that would like to add items to the future agenda? I'm looking, I'm seeing nods of no. Okay, and finally, we will now move to item L, visitor comments. Ms. Rai, are there any visitor comments at this time? President McKibben, we do not have any raised hands. I'd just like to remind our attendees that if you'd like to provide a public comment at this time, to please raise your hand on your Zoom client platform. Okay, waiting a couple more seconds. Okay, it appears there are no visitor comments at this time. We do not need to return to closed session. I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.